Thank you, everyone. So I'm Mo Holkar. I am here to talk about an aspect of LARP design. In particular, it's an aspect of character design. You may not think of yourself as a designer. Some of the people here in the room, some of you watching at home, you may think of yourself as a player or a participant in other people's designs. But one thing which I want to bring across in this short talk is that players are also designers. In particular, they're designers of the characters that they play. Now, my talk is about skeletons and also about flesh. How can characters be designed in a way that empowers players to make the character their own special personal creation, but without them fearing that by doing so, they're going to break the LARP design in some important way? In the famous mixing desk of LARP, that metaphor for LARP design, which has become so widely used within our community, one of the sliders on the desk is called character creation responsibility. At one extreme of the slider, characters are completely designed by the LARP right, and they just hand them to the players to play. At the other end of the spectrum, characters are completely designed by players, and they then plug them into the world that the LARP right has created. In between, there's a whole range of possibilities, a spectrum of possibilities in which responsibility for design is shared between the LARP right and the player. And I'm just going to pick out one thread from that, which is what I call skeletons. So what is a skeleton? It is a summary of the character created by the designer, which contains the minimum elements that are absolutely necessary to make the design work and the maximum space that is possible to allow the player to be creative, to personalize the character. How much the designer puts in and how much space there is for the player will vary from LARP to LARP. But I'm going to talk here about how to approach this as a general technique. Typically, the way it works is that the designer produces a bunch of skeletons, either the players choose between them or else they're assigned them via some sort of casting process, and then there are tools, possibly in a pre-LARP workshop, possibly in pre-play, um, which allow them to put flesh onto that skeleton and to form it into a body of the player's own design. Okay, so if you're a LARP designer, this is what you should be asking yourself if you're thinking about a skeleton-based approach. How much of the characters do you actually need to define yourself to make sure that your LARP works? How much of the characters can you afford to leave open and give the player freedom and be confident that whatever they do within that space isn't going to harm the balance of the LARP overall? So it's about this trade-off of freedom and risk and where to draw the line. Here's an example. This is from a LARP that um, Kevin Burns and I wrote together um, some years ago called Real Men. It is set in the modern world. It's about a group of young men who meet as teenagers and it revisits them at various stages through their lives and sees how they've grown up together and how age has affected them in various ways. So at the start, this is what we gave them to choose from. There's a bunch of skeletons which are structured exactly like this. The notes in square brackets I've put on here for your benefit. Um, so it's very simple, it's just an initial of the name, the player chooses the rest of the name. The showman is the kind of archetype or concept for this particular character. They have a secret fear, they have a fantasy, and they have an impossible dream. Um, if you've played the LARP yourself, you'll know what these means, but I won't go into it now. Suffice to say, these are aspects of the character that are important for how the LARP is to work as a whole. And so they're given in the skeleton. The skeleton is then supplemented with a bunch of questions, which is what allows the player to put flesh on its bones. And these are the questions from real men. So you'll see there are a mix of kind of biographical stuff. The player is free to invent these details about the character, um, life and history, and then also to invent these further details about their attitudes, their beliefs, and their ways of thinking. And this is all stuff that, because we told the players it's set in the real world, um, so 
they couldn't create someone who's like a high priest of Cthulhu or an alien visitor in human clothing. They're creating realistic characters, and so we are happy to let them do so with freedom in answer to those questions. Another approach, and that's an alternative to giving them like a free text box to answer a question like this, is to offer them a list of choices. So, for example, this is um, from another LARP called Delta Sector Helter Skelter. <laughs> and the players were able to choose their occupations, but they chose them from a bunch that we'd drawn up before. So we had a load of cards, we spread them out on the table, each card had one of these occupations printed on it, each player chose one card. And then between, once they'd done so, they then made up the crew of, and officers of a starship. Um, um, now, there's, um, there's two sort of strengths to this approach. One is that the players feel comfortable and safe. They know that if they're choosing one of the bits of card that you wrote for them, they can't possibly get it wrong. Whereas, you know, in a science fiction lab, if you just gave them a free text box and they created something like, maybe it's a universe that doesn't have aliens, it only has humans. And if they'd answered it with being an alien character, that would break the LARP. This way, they know they're not going to. Because managing player comfort is the most important thing when we're talking about this process. The other thing that giving them a list of occupations like this does is it tells them a bit about what the LARP is going to be like. So it's a science fiction LARP, they know that already, but you can see from looking at the list that it's more like Star Trek than it is like Star Wars. And you can see that um, there's going to be play around interpersonal stuff and feelings and drama, as well as going missions where you go down to a planet and shoot aliens or get shot by them, in the case of the guy with the red shirt. So, um, those of you who played the Drinklings here the other day will know that's made up of a, a whole set of cards like this, which parameterize play in a kind of a safe and comforting way for the players. They've got complete freedom within certain very rigid bounds. Things to think about when you're putting together your skeletons and your list of questions. The question should be specific to the theme and to the setting of the LARP. So, for example, um, in a LARP that I wrote called Life Lessons, it's about um, the characters of students at a life drawing class. So one of the questions that is asked is about what is this character's relationship to art? That wouldn't be necessary in a LARP like Delta Sector, Helter Skelter. You pick out questions that are going to work for the kind of themes that you want to explore within the LARP because then as the player answers those questions, they're already starting to think about how is this character going to fit into the bigger picture. Having a range of questions like this where players can choose freely gives them an important power, an important power over their comfort, which is how close to home or far from home they wish to play. They may wish to play a character who's very similar to themselves and to tweak one detail. So, for example, in the case of real men, which is mostly played by male players, they might want to, for example, play a character who's of a different sexuality to themselves, but otherwise keep details that they're familiar with so that they can play, improvise that character comfortably and easily, but there's this one important facet of character which they wish to explore. Or alternatively, they could create something completely different, but because you've got a range of options open to them, they can decide how far or how near they want to go, which is obviously much more difficult in cases where the characters are all fully pre-designed by the designer. You can include questions which are intended to, to prompt important thoughts and feelings that you're going to use during the LARP. So going back to life lessons, one of the prompts is that the players are supposed to do a little sketch of which might be a drawing of how that character sees themselves or how some, some aspect of how they see the world it's a tool for reflection as they're creating the character. It's not actually important within the, within the context of the, the character creation as such, but it's important because during the course of the LARP, they're going to be using drawing as a tool for capturing emotions and thoughts. And so having to do this during character creation as well is a kind of a soft way of preparing them for that in a risk-free situation because no one else gets to see that drawing. It's only for you as a player to use yourself. Um, questions don't have to be just text, they can be physical tasks. So probably most of you are used to the classic exercise of walking around a room as your character would walk, and then perhaps the organiser will say, okay, now walk as they walk, 
when they're angry, now walk as they, as they walk when they're extremely happy, and so on. And this is it's the same sort of thing, basically. It's a way of, this time, feeling yourself into your character's physique and body with freedom. The organizer doesn't tell you your character has to walk in this particular way. They let you find for yourself where is the space. And so that's a very literal flesh that you're putting onto the character. There's a whole huge area which we don't have time to talk about, which is um, co-creation with other players. So, for example, there's a LARP called Dawnstone, written by the brilliant designer Joanna Piancastelli, in which characters, the players rather, flesh each other's skeletons. They contribute material which other players then build into their characters. And the result of this is a kind of a very tightly collaborative and a closely linked set of characters who can then go on to have high drama from minute one once the LARP starts playing. And you can also, of course, build relationships with other players, characters, and so on during this process. But um, for more of that, read the article in the, in the KP book. It's great. So I'm going to finish. These are the sort of key takeaways. If you're a designer, it's natural to want to control the process. Um, it's natural to want to be sure that the characters are as you wish them to be so that you know they're going to work within your game framework. But what I'm saying is try and cut that down and pull that back as much as you can. Try and concentrate only on what you absolutely need to control and try and enjoy surrendering the bits that you don't need. If you're a player, where you have been given space to create, use it, explore it, and have fun with it because the designer is saying to you, you, can, you have this freedom, you're not going to break the LARP by choosing something which doesn't fit in with it. I trust you, I've given you this opportunity, so don't be afraid. And um, this is a quote from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but it's something that I think is really important in game design, the idea of rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. So the walls are very solid, but within there's freedom and there's space to play and to enjoy yourselves. And I think that is true about LARP in general, and in particular, it's about this mode of character creation, which if you've not experienced it, I'd like you to give it a go. Thank you.